Thank you, Svera. I'm conscious I'm the last thing between ourselves and lunch, so I'll try and finish as soon as I can by, by half past one. Um, my, my theme is going to be the, the impact of the digital age on, on our workforce. Um, it, it, inevitably, I'm going to be overlapping a little bit with some of the themes we've heard over the last couple of days. My hope is that I'll be complementing some of what's being said um, rather than re repeating it. But I have to say, some of the talks we've had, most of us have been absolutely excellent. It's been a fantastic, fantastic conference. I want to start, a theme that Michael started with as well yesterday, these are the ages and revolutions of man. Um, and maybe one of the things to draw out here is the, the longevity and the intervals between them decreasing with time. So we had in the, uh, the 19th century the Industrial Revolution, um, the, the Digital Revolution, I think arguably heralded in, in the 1970s as we move from analogue processing of information to digital processing information, particularly seen through the advent of the personal computer. I think what, it, what it's done is it's really transformed the economies uh, of so many countries worldwide from a manufacturing base very much to um, economies in which the gross domestic product is based on services rather than manufacturing. And, and, and the speed with this is happening is poss possibly emphasised, brought home in... Um, in this slide of uh, the market capitalization of the biggest companies in the world over the last 20 odd years, uh, we can go back to the 1980s as well and, and familiar names like um, Unilever, BP would turn up as well. But, 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 but look at how we are transitioning to market capitalizations of the information technology companies, not the manufacturing companies anymore. So Apple, as the biggest company at the end of 2017, Alphabet Inc., which is the holding company for, for, for Google, and, and other familiar names there, you, you'll see them as well. Um, keep your eyes on Berkshire Health, Berkshire Hathaway. It's, it's a company I'll come back to. I, I think one of the key learning lessons coming back to the, to the message about the speed of this revolution becoming an age is that for those of us still sitting on the sidelines thinking that we're not going to be affected by it, I think the opportunity to influence it has already been lost. For those who are leading this, there's a message coming home, is that to stay in this market, in time they're going to have to diversify and capitalise on some of the algorithm and artificial intelligence driven processes to diversify, sustain their presence in what is the new age. And maybe to bring this home also, what is it that's in common with some of these new age digital technology providers. Well, I, I'd say it, it, it's, it's enhancing communication between people, and in our case, increasingly patients. It's algorithm processes for an Amazon warehouse here, moving, dare I say, packages rather than samples around, but algorithm different processes. Enhancing communication here, using artificial intelligence to the extent that they're starting to do some of the thinking for us. But the key thing that, is, that is unites all of them is their use of the workforce. So a typical 10th century workforce is a relatively hierarchical management structure with a chief executive and a chairman on the top, but a mass of people on tiers of layers below performing lots of functions and relatively expensive. Human resources expensive and if we head towards the 20th century, 21st century, increasing what we're heading towards is a workforce much more equitably distributed, of course, um, but reliant on a few leaders at the top who have the knowledge, skills and competency to deliver to a relatively small workforce below. But following predictable tasks rather than relying on unpredictable human resource, which often can be an expensive commodity. So to bring it home, say, with a more practical example, coming back to the, um, the table that we had of the biggest companies in the world, if, if we look at something like Procter & Gamble, I think you'll all be familiar with it. Um, this is publicly available information from um, the Global 500. Um, they're, they're a, a food and consumer goods producer. Their, their workforce has declined from, well, 130-odd thousand to about 100, uh, what is it, 190-odd, just been known 100,000. Look what's happened here with Facebook. So they now have a workforce of 2017 of 25,000. I suspect in 2008, you don't quite mark Mark Zuckerberg there, but I'm sure he's in there somewhere. Um, 
the key thing here is, is that Procter & Gamble have a market capitalization of about 185 billion at the end of 2017. Uh, the current market capitalization of Facebook is 516 billion with a workforce of 25,000. Just to go back one second, one more point to make here is that the trend we're seeing here with Procter & Gamble is not dissimilar to the workforce figures we're seeing in UK in laboratory medicine. I'm sorry, I have to do a lot of UK figures. I'm, I'm not so familiar with, with figures from elsewhere. I, I hope it's reasonably reproducible. But in UK, the biomedical scientist numbers in the last 15 years have declined from 34,000 to 30,000. I, I think you'd argue it's a similar trend. We have figures on specialists in laboratory medicine, consultant medical practitioners, consultant clinical science as well, but they're not as accurate. If anything, I believe there is even a more steeper decline than we have seen in biomedical scientists. So, to focus particularly on what's been the impact on our workforce, and I take some of the laboratory medicine disciplines we're all familiar with, culture and sensitivity in our microbiology labs, labor-intensive techniques, repetitive tasks, taking two to three days to get a, a, a meaningful result to determine what antibiotic, if any, um, a, a patient might need. So what have we gone to now? Well, this is a picture from my own laboratory where very proudly Molditoff was introduced about oh, three years ago now. Uh, and for some of us might remember 15 years ago, there's enormous concerns about the amount of data being generated by Molditoff. Would we, would we ever be able to interpret it all? And of course, what's happened now is we've got library banks of information being built up allow us to determine sensitivities using moldy tough. If I take one or two people in this slide, so this is Sean. Sean has taken a career move. He's gone to our histopathology laboratory. He wasn't pushed out, I assure you, but what I can assure you is, with Sean going, he's not had to be replaced, and within three years, the moldy tough has been paid for. This is Lewis, who is our laboratory manager in microbiology, who's fast being identified as a future specialist in laboratory medicine for the innovative package he's put together to bring Moldy Toff into practice. And this, I think some of you in microbiology will recognise this as one of these huge, fast throughput virus detection uh, technologies using PCR-based technology. This is currently based in central Manchester, and central Manchester, which is our overlord in Manchester of the 10 hospitals, are using this as a vehicle to attract and centralise all the workload across Manchester. So you can see there's agendas going on here. This is my colleague, Dr. Mark Pearson, a consultant histopathologist in, in, in Bolton. Mark likes looking down the microscope a lot. What he's not doing at the moment is talking to a lot of other people. He's, he's a good friend of mine, but he, he is concerned about what digital pathology. Um, but what's going on here is, is a sharing of expertise, a ready exchange of information by people working at the time and where and when they want to, whether it's at home or whether it's at work, and potentially having their slides interpreted on the other side of the world at midnight when it's 12 o'clock in our time. So much better use of information. Moving on again, a lot of us will recognise here the thermal cycler, um, two and a half hours to do a PCR reaction followed by possibly a restriction in the nuclease digestion and then electrophoretic step using toxic polycrylamide gel. So what have we gone to nowadays? Well, we've gone to something like that, real-time PCR technologies, including simple point mutation technologies, combining everything in one with light um, fluorescence detection and next generation sequencing coming along as well, readily accessible digital technology information. So for blood sciences, uh, I managed to get a snapshot last week of Laboratory Neumeyer. Uh, this is Michael, I think, doing some of his glucoses. Um, moving on though, this is what we're having in the 21st century. This is Lisa Reed. Lisa works in Gateshead which is recently combined laboratories. Three laboratories have come together. It's been funded by NHS England as an exemplar laboratory. So Lisa is, I think, currently analysing um, 5,000 biochemistry samples a day, 15 tests on each. You can do the quick maths, it's about 75,000 tests. The quality control is alerted with Westgard rules, and she's alerted to anything that goes wrong. Uh, there is simple interpretation of the results being done as well. All the pre-analytics are being done Lisa has a first-class honours degree in biomedical science. Do we need it? 
and we cannot possibly move on with a clear mention about point-of-care testing. Many of you will be familiar with this sort of device can be used in the peripheral settings, potentially accessing to emergency settings in smaller remote settings. Um, the Lab in the Bag initiative, Richard Fisher might be familiar with this. This is something increasing that we're doing in the northwest, going out to care homes, uh, people with learning disabilities, uh, possibly uh, also going to be using this, people with mental health issues. Um, I don't know if Snetsana is familiar with this one. I'm not sure in all the parameters, the measurement parameters that uh, you came up with. I suspect this technology might actually be ahead of what you're trying to measure. This is a relatively simple device, you would think. You can measure your own blood glucose and have it stored on your iPhone. Is it accurate? Is it reliable? I have no idea. Is action being taken on those results? Well, again, I have no idea, but the key thing here is, I'm sure Snetsana would agree, is this, this is accessible, it is available now. And maybe it comes back to a point here, what is our key role in determining the appropriate use of technologies like this? So, in terms of the impact of the digital age, what I hope to persuade you of is that it's enabling higher quality services. We have huge capacity to deliver our services now in a way we didn't. They're faster. We're making better use of human resource, and we're starting to make better use of knowledge management. We're getting individual examples throughout this conference of it starting to be used, possibly not on a mass scale, and maybe that's our next challenge. My overriding point would be, though, is that it's being driven by industry, and I'm happy to argue that with anyone here. And I think we were hearing yesterday from our representatives from Siemens and from um, Sysmex and, and Roche is that, that they have a vision horizon scanning infrastructures in place to keep up to pace with possible developments. They also have resources potentially to stay ahead of the curve in a way that I'm not sure that, that, that we do on a mass scale. We are extremely innovative in what we do, but when it comes to translating to mass scale, do we have a challenge? And this takes me back to some of our information technology providers. It comes back to a point that Larry Krishk was making yesterday. In terms of resources, the likes of Amazon teaming up now with Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's Hathaway, have huge resources. And there's a learning lesson here, I think, also, is, is that a recognition that the way we provide healthcare often is a very complex local, regional, and national infrastructures. And potentially, using technology, the opportunity to actually bypass some of the structures, which I think, certainly in the UK, I'm sure must uh, apply in many other countries as well, that bedevil our opportunities sometimes to make change. So if I take it back to that slide, I know this is a little bit cheeky, but dare I suggest that what we have here a factory for processing packages is not necessarily so different from a factory processing samples. This is the same laboratory that Lisa Reed works in, combined of three major laboratories into one. Um, they're handling, as I said to you, 5,000 biochemistry samples a day. This is an integrated immunology, hematology, transfusion and biochemistry lab laboratory. It's run by 45 people. They've reduced the workforce from 75 to 45 in the space of three years. There's something also a learning lesson here for what the information technology providers are beginning to realise, is that much of healthcare, this is the Kaiser Trigon, I'm sure many are familiar with it, is, is, is process-driven, it's algorithm-driven, it's amenable to some of the processes which have already been established by our information technology providers. And is there potential growth in the market? Well, these are some data that was given to me a few years ago. This is the number of type 1 diabetics in UK at various years. I never believed this could happen when I saw this slide in 2000. Uh, Richard Fitton might want to correct me here, but I think we reached 4 million diabetics in 2015 in the UK. So this comes back to this question. To sustain presence in the market, find repetitive algorithm, artificial intelligence driven tasks, but find markets where also the demand is likely to increase and therefore you can sustain presence. So you could potentially see, I know it's slightly controversial, where the new age industry, the information technology industry, might become more and more relevant to us. 
And we start to raise ethical issues as well, and this, this is themes which have come through in the last couple of days. Should, should an artificial intelligence company have your health records? And that's something I, I, I will return to again. So, are we ready as specialists in laboratory medicine for the digital age? And I don't think we have to go too far to, to too many magazines to say that healthcare often is running behind implementation, delivery, and ability to respond to the digital challenge. We have basic training in place. So I'm delighted to, to share with you that the, the latest version of the AFLM syllabus uh, is, is out in June. Um, sorry, it's out at end of June, start of July. It gives a basic education um, in the various laboratory medicine disciplines. We can have management and leadership courses, and this is a course that was run by my professional organisation, the Association for Clinical Biochemistry. Um, and these are the sorts of topics which are being covered. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll let you read it yourself. The overriding message from me that's coming through here is this is reflecting status quo. This is relatively inward looking. This is not to denigrate this, this sort of course because they're absolutely vital in the next stage of, of becoming a specialist. But is this preparing us for what I think is the new age of what is likely to happen in terms of technology changing the way we deliver laboratory medicine? I, I, I would argue is this our basic training gives us familiar... How am I doing for time, Sarah? 10 minutes, Ten minutes OK. Um, our basic education and training through management leadership courses, uh, uh, the, 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 the education tree we follow, does give us a lot of expertise. Pathway and protocol design, diabetes, heart disease, and, and the like, anticoagulation. Technology of innovation, we're very proud of that, and we've heard a lot of that already over the last couple of days. Research, development, and audit, quality assurance, health and, and safety, and, 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 and laboratory leadership. The key thing here being laboratory leadership. Is, is, is this enough for, for the new age? I, I, I would challenge us to say, no, I don't think it is. For the new age, it's a new look. It, it's a look outside the laboratory. Because if we don't do it, others are going to come along and do it. It's here determining the clinical needs to be for local environments, disease prevalence incidents, resources evaded, patient values. Maybe just emphasise on that because I think that's something that's really come home from the sessions we had this morning from Dr. Witterman, from, from, um, from Patricia as, as, as well, and from Hofer de Boog um, and Richard Fitton. Patient values, understanding what patients want and how to liaise and communicate with them. It came through from Albert van der Berg yesterday as well, who highlighted the fact we need to understand more about behavioural science. Now, I know this is going out the scope of what we know at the moment, but if we're going to determine local clinical need and we're the best positioned to do that, we're going to have to broaden our knowledge and skills. And I'd say this was really brought home to me in a debate I attended recently with Svera and uh, Danielle Friedman, where this slide brought it home for me. Svera can correct me on the um, interpretation of it. So this is in Kenya. This is the HIV tester going out on his bike. I have no idea whether the bike has punctures, whether it's had, had its, its annual check, whether it's safe. Um, I don't know whether he's been competency assessed, or whether even his competency has been reassessed. Um, what I do know is that the participation in the external quality assurance is nothing like as good as we'd like in the laboratory. Absolutely shocking. I also know that he's got 85,000 results wrong, but he has got short of 3 million results right. And clearly examples where a diagnostic test can manifestly influence the treatment and support that a patient gets after that, which is much more expensive than the diagnostic test in the first place. So a key lesson here about, I think, going beyond our conventional evidence-based medicine and understanding what is required locally and understanding also the pressure that patients can bring. And I think that was a point brought home by Ian as well in his talk, where three patients stood up and said what they wanted, and the, ro the, the roost was ruled by patient power. So delivery, development and delivery of technology-led solutions is something we do already, but there's something, again, about us understanding the local need and understanding how the laboratory role 
will develop in relation to particularly care being delivered closer to home. And this is the point I think Fabrizio Cerotti brought up yesterday and Per Jorgensen is understanding that, yes, the central laboratory still has a key role here, but going forward, the opportunity for quantitative data from near patient testing supporting the qualitative interpretation of a clinical consultation, the balancing act going forward is going to head more and more towards the patient outside the hospital. So this, I think, is a central plank. Safe, reliable, cost-effective and evidence base. Things we're familiar with, but I think this is our unique role. We're coming back to the point of potentially information technology uh, provided leading on this, potentially rolling out technology that we know is not necessarily safe and should not be used and is not value for money for the taxpayer. I don't think we have enough business acumen. Yes, we contract for our new Roche or Siemens analyzer, but doing the contracting outside, marketing what we do, have the negotiation skills to sit at the table and participate rather than being on the menu is something I don't think we're good enough at. Information governance, I'll, I'll skip over this rather quickly because I think it's, it's a theme that has really come through in the last couple of days. Petra Wilson covered it uh, yesterday extensively. Um, the regulatory frameworks are changing. Well, I, I, some of the regulatory frameworks are not keeping up with the advances in digital technology. I mean, the simple example for me would be to go back to uh, Mark Pearson, my consultant histopathologist colleague, I think quite rightly expressed concern about his images being um, uh, interpreted by somebody in South Africa at three in the morning and not knowing anything about the competence or the regulation that cover that individual whose scans are being interpreted on his, interpreted on his behalf and reported to our hospital. So th there, are, there are regulatory frameworks, issues, issues coming to the fore ethical issues we've discussed all, all, already. And I think it becomes particularly relevant when, when you start questioning is, 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 is who, who is determining the outcome of, of elections. So are we starting to run ahead, that information technology is running ahead of potentially the way we run our democracies? So the clinical bioinformatics, um, I support exactly what Jonathan was saying yesterday. Genomics is a fantastic buzzword which every minister in UK will, uh, will, will, will shout from the rafters in the two years that he or she has been appointed and will then go away again. But there are other things coming through as well. A better understanding of health and economics beyond the laboratory. Knowledge management, data mining, predictive analytics, physical sciences. Again, that's something that's come through the last couple of days in various talks. Laboratory medicine has a contribution to make, undoubtedly, in healthcare and, and care outside the hospital, outside the hospital. But imaging, MRI, PET scanning, CT scanning, the idea that we go out to try and sell a clinical and diagnostic testing services and just bring our blood sample, I think those days are over. And the provision of direct clinical care and primary care and community environments, again, is a theme that's come through the last couple of days, is the need not to rely anymore on purely medical practitioners. And uh, Karl Bremer has been given a, 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 a superb example of that, of someone who's managing his own care in close consultation with a medical practitioner. For ourselves, I think possibly the example here is, if, 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 again, I have to draw back to UK on this, in UK, at the end of last year, we had a 6% gap in the workforce we needed and what was in the workforce actually in place. Now, I think we're, I, undoubtedly we're going to have a brain drain over the next couple of years because of Brexit. And barriers are being reduced to get more recruitment into UK. But at whose cost? At the cost of those very countries who need those services themselves. And again, to come back to this idea that we don't have to rely on medical practitioners to provide some of the self-management and supportive care. Some of our pharmacists in the UK, so it must be elsewhere, are already going out. Uh, and I know this is something Ian has wide promoted, is, is the use of healthcare scientists getting out of the laboratory and starting to provide more and more the clinical services and supportive patients. There are courses available. So very quickly, just go through this one. This is one from the Mount Sinai. Again, another one here from 
this is the Karolinski Institute. My learning lesson from looking at some of these courses is, is, is that they're, they're very much geared at a chief executive level or a chief information officer level. They do not complement the skills we already have in laboratory medicine. And maybe there's a missing gap here that needs to be filled. I have to say this slide is deliberately vague because I think this is something we need to draw out in discussion this afternoon, is how are we going to take our education and training to the next level for specialists? My argument be, would be it has to be in partnership with stakeholders. And I'd, I'd say the diagnostics industry, potentially our commissioners elsewhere, anyone who's got an interest in healthcare, and particularly as Patricia would, Patricia would say, our patients. We need a unified approach. I don't think we can have a siloed approach. It has to be an international perspective. A silo approach is simply not going to work. It has to be an overarching leadership approach. Potentially professional societies, I think some of you can work at potentially where I'm going with this. Uh, the opportunity to link it to academic institutions and other certification or qualifications, uh, are potentially linked to high, higher qualifications. I'm sorry if it's a bit vague. It's, it's deliberately vague. It's designed to have input after we've had the, our, our lunch. Ian gave me the title, Who's Teaching the Pony, for which I thanked him very much. Um, there's a changing role here between the teacher and student that I think we need to take into account. Historically, the teacher determines what the student learns, and it's didactic, one-way teaching. Students or learners now have the choice to learn what and where, what they want to learn, when to learn it, at what time to learn it, what source of information to tap into. So increasingly, I think what we're looking at is a difference in role between a teacher and a student from an, to an educator and a learner. And if many of the people in the room here are the educators, there's something also here about the new talent being in the driving seat being more familiar with some of the technologies that, that we're talking about here. So maybe for some of the new talent, I might suggest to some of the grumpy old men and, dare I say, grumpy old women here, be careful with us, treat us gently. That's it. I'll leave you with the leadership competencies. I think we need to, take, to, to uh, accumulate to take us to the next level, but hopefully we're not too far over time, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs>